Hello, Cornell, and welcome to Q Today. I'm Nate Bello. And I'm Mitch Vick, and this is our show for December the 14th. And coming up on today's show, Duncan Barnett, former director of the, at the Caribou Regional District, has now thrown his hat into the ring for the NDP nomination to contest May's provincial election. Interesting. And coming up later in the show, we have a couple of interviews for you. Uh, Bert DeVink and Dave Brown finished their Golden Talk, and Scott Elliott interviews Brian Kozak of the Quinell Kangaroos, so we'll look forward to that. And here at, Qu at Q Today, we bring you the recent news provided by our partnership with the Quinell Observer, along with our own news and our own commentary. And we also bring you some stories from the field. For example, Scott Elliott's out there. Mm hmm Okay. So moving on into the news there, Nate, what do you got first? Well, the first thing is, look at this guy's picture. This is Julian Clement. And uh, Danica Hebert just wrote a story about how Julian recently cut his hair off after growing it for two years. This was not just a story about a kid growing his hair long, though, Mitch. No. He had a purpose. He grew it out to be able to give it to the Quinell, uh, to the Prince George Canadian Cancer Society so that it can be made into a, a wig for another kid who is undergoing that's treatment. That's great. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah. He donated 11 inches, and he's also, uh, he's also collecting some money with the help of Coralou teachers, and he says, short is stylish, but long hair is natural. I wouldn't know. Well, I used to know, <laughs> long time ago. Uh, he also admitted that after cutting it off, a few of his friends didn't even recognize him. Well, I saw the pictures in the paper, and I would have to agree with you. He looked very different. Yeah. Very different. Okay. So, moving on to our next story, we're going to talk about the Barkerville exhibit. A new exhibit in Barkerville is going to go high tech in a groundbreaking exhibit that fuses new technology and history. Chinese citizens will have the opportunity to identify ancestors who were key to the history of British Columbia. Who Am I? Bridging the Pacific from Guangdong to Barkerville and back opens at Sun Yet Sen Gardens in Vancouver and runs from December 13th to January 11th. From there, it will embark on an 18-month tour to Hong Kong and Guangdong province in China. As you may know, Guangdong was the home of many of the Chinese who came to British Columbia and then on to Barkerville. Many of the photographs came from the extensive collection of C.D. Hoy, a Quinell resident for many years. His home is now a dental office across from the Billy Barker Hotel on the corner of McLean Street and Barlow. And uh, that beautiful renovation they finished up last year, they did a, a magnificent mm -hmm. job finishing up that home. They, they certainly did. Mm -hmm. uh, C.D. Hoy uh, is very well known about from, uh, from people of uh, our previous generation. He had stores here. His kids uh, went, to sc went to school here. They all moved away. But a few years ago, they all came back. And we had a bit of a, 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 a greeting together about it and how we would how we would honor C.D. Hoy's memory. His, uh, his uh, house is actually the first one to have that clapboard on, on it in Quinell. Is that right? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's amazing. And now it's a dental office. That's right. <laughs> and it's uh, gonna be a fixture for many more years to come with uh, the mm -hmm. great job they did fixing it up. So, yeah. so Strap what's next, Nate? on skis. Okay, this is something that I tried doing a few times and slid and fell in, but I could get enthused about it for other people. <laughs> okay. They're always saying, come on out, Nate. And who knows, maybe I will, but Annie Gallant wrote a, a perfect way to enjoy the winter season and uh, cross-country skiing at Hollis Lake about 15 minutes south of downtown off the Quinell Hydraulic Road is a place to go. The Caribou Ski Touring Club made an important improvement over the, over the last year in that, in that they now rent skis uh -huh. and, so it's, and they have a lot of them. And as Tanya Grun, the CSTC Youth Program Coordinator says, that really opened up the sport to many, many people. Also, longtime ski uh, clubber, Ron Wittain, who we had on the, we've had on the show from time to time, says we're open 24-7 and seven days a week with a, just a nominal, nominal fee. We even have moonlight skiing. All you have to do is put the headlights on and you could go down, down, the, down the paths. Christmas hours, December 26th to January 6th. The shop will be open for rentals 10 to 5 every day. That's great. I got to tell you, I've been to Hallis several times. Oh, yeah? 
um, and it's it's really I think a really classy, well organized mm -hmm. um, facility. The the they got groomed trails. This isn't uh, bushwhacking or anything like that. Really well groomed, well organized place and. Mm -hmm. uh, I really enjoy going there, so I recommend everyone give it a try, and it's great. You're right, you can go skiing anytime you want, just leave a little, uh, they have a, it's a $10 um, fee, and you just put it in the little uh, mailbox there, and you just go. Oh, good. It's great. Okay, so we got some uh, curling scores next up here. Five, four, seven, five, nine, eight, eight, three, and seven, six. All right, so now we'll, <laughs> we'll make them make sense. So Caribou Pulp beat Jar Transportation, mm -hmm. five, four. Child Development. Uh, edged out A and W seven to five, and a little bit of a high-scoring affair with the Willie. Uh, is that the Billy Barker? No, Willie? Billy. Willie is the other team. Oh, Willie. Okay. Willie. Yeah, Willie. Very high-scoring affair against the Billy nine to six. Investors a uh, bit of a blowout there. Beat uh, Karen's eight to three, and a close affair with Douglas Lake edging out Frank Supermarket seven to six. So. Oh, so the idea, you know, really, you don't have to be into curling, but reading the articles, whoever writes the curling articles, because there was no byline on it, congratulations. It, it, you could be into creative writing and not into curling, but really enjoy the article there. <laughs> so I, that's why I didn't even attempt to kind of make it uh, as creative as right. it was in the paper. We'll defer to the paper on the artistic uh, merit there. So. Okay. Over to you, Nate. Okay, well, yes, guess what? The Women's Resource Center has a new furnace. Now, what's a big story? Maybe you got a new furnace. Well, I'll tell you what the big story is. I was talking to Susan Scott uh, uh, earlier today, and what happened was they, uh, all of a sudden, their furnace conked out, and uh, they, they, they called a great uh, indoor HVAC company, and the guy was there within a two minutes because uh, I don't know why they just said hey uh, you can't have that out of Women's Resource Center you guys do a lot of good work the guy came saw a leak or something like that I said I could patch that leak maybe but uh, I don't know I could bring my boss over the boss came over Cam the man Cam came over the boss and he said you know what we're gonna donate a new furnace to you Wow. we're gonna and uh, we're gonna throw in the labor too so Incredible. they're doing it on an upcoming Saturday uh, th why are they doing it? Because we, uh, we have some money for donations and we care about this community and obviously Women's Resource Center, you are doing great work w uh, uh, combating violence against women mm -hmm. and providing other consulting and other services to, to women in yeah. our community. So congratulations to the Women's Resource Center and congratulations to Great Indoor HVAC Company. I agree. As a customer of Great Indoors with my HVAC at my store, they're great people to deal with. So Right. And this is not a paid commercial either. No. Nope. They just came <laughs> up to the front and they, they're helping our community. That's great. So moving to some political news, uh, an announcement in our area. Rancher and former Caribou Regional District Director Duncan Barnett has announced his intention to seek the NDP nomination in Caribou North saying he will work to be a strong local representative and ensure the constituency is well represented in Victoria. Over the last few months, many people have asked me to put my name forward, Barnett said. I intend to be a strong voice and work with Adrian Dix and the NDP team to get things done for people in the Caribou. Barnett is hearing that there is an appetite for change in government after 12 years of the BC Liberals. People I talk to are ready for a change of Victoria and they want me to make real changes to make things better in the Caribou, he said. I've learned that it takes a practical approach and working with a good team to bring about change. I intend to campaign positively, listen to people, and work to find lasting solutions to the challenges we face. Barnett was a CRD director for 10 years and is all, also has experience at the provincial level with land use, forestry, agriculture, and First Nations issues. He has had an on-the-ground work experience in most of our natural resource industries and as a small business owner, currently runs a family ranching business on Horsefly Road. The nomination meeting is scheduled for January the 20th. And uh, assuming he's successful, uh, what do you think his chances are against someone like Bob Simpson? Well, he has to be successful in the nomination first, and sure. we hear rumors about another candidate, a city councillor no less, that mm -hmm. may be running, so we'll see who, who takes the nomination. Uh, well, I think it's a, it's a matter of uh, do people want to uh, vote to change government, or do they want to uh, uh, stay with uh, 
the an incumbent who isn't part of any government and yeah. you know uh, does it matter to people whether they are part of the solution to change government or would they rather just uh, stay with the person who you know fights from the outside I mean you know you could go either way yeah. and uh, we'll see it's going to be interesting but luckily it's not like the United States it'll be done in May <laughs> Yay! <laughs> it's not a four-year uh, campaign thank goodness for that <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah okay thanks Nate okay Last week we brought you a story about uh, of the, about the kangaroos. They had their big victory, 5-4, uh, uh, over uh, Laclahash. And uh, we had an interview with Waylon LaRue, uh, the, uh, the captain. And Scott Elliott also talked at that time to Brian Kozak, the coach. And here's, our, here's his conversation with Brian after the game. At the Twin Arenas, uh, we just had a fantastic hockey game here, the Quinell Kangaroos against the Laclahash Tomahawks. I'm pleased to be joined by uh, the coach of the uh, Quinell Kangaroos, Brian Kozak. Brian, congratulations on an excellent game. Thank you. Yeah, it, it turned out well, a eh? 5-4 win, a little bit closer than I thought it should have been, though. <laughs> well, you know, it was, it was an exciting game yeah. and great fan support, yeah. as usual. Yeah. Um, you know, when you shoot a team, when you shoot 60 shots at a net, that's right. And not just the shots; it wasn't shots from the outside. It was shots from like opportunities, scoring opportunities. Yeah. yeah. That that game could have easily been a different yeah. game in that sense, but we did what we had to do to get the win. Then. Yeah, for sure. I mean, really, the goalie held them in there. The 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 play was in there in three quarters of the game, but yeah. uh, he kind of stood on his head a lot, and he almost doubled them up on shots. So, I mean, what what more can you do, right? <laughs> so, tell me a little bit about the team and and how it's come along during the year. You, do you feel it gelling? you feel it coming together? Oh, for sure. Yeah. It, right, right from the start, like, um, you know, with, with with our coaching staff, you know, with, with Bob Marsh and, and Wayne Holmes and, and Bill, we, we brought the guys in that they know that Rue's history. They know yeah. that yeah. team first attitude. And, and that team first attitude is what what we talk about. Yeah. And that's what the guys do. And you can see it. It just takes time. Yeah. It takes time with any team. you. When you come to any team, you start to get that attitude. Yeah. You can see guys are just cheering each other yeah, on. It doesn't absolutely. matter what. If they get one shift or ten shifts, doesn't yeah. matter. They're they're cheering each other on, and yeah. now it's starting to gel. We, we're yeah. seeing things how it works, and it was exciting. When you came into this, were were you at all hesitant, knowing how strong the Roos have been in this community, and knowing kind of the the boots that you were coming in to fill? Or well, that's a tough question. <laughs> that is a good. Well, for sure, it, it's you know, as a coach, you always want to. Um, do the best for sure. the team and have sure. success. That's that's the whole idea. And with that pressure of the rules and their history, yeah. you you know, and, and the coaches last year did an amazing job as a first year team. Yeah, you no know? doubt so, about it. So we come in here and now we're looking at okay, now we have to do better than we did last year. Pick it up and just it a takes time to, to, to build that. And the great thing is about is you know, obviously I did my homework before I came in was that we had we have out of 30 plus players, there, there's only one guy that's not born here. Yeah, that's not amazing. Not a one Quinnell guy. That's right? amazing. And, and his best friends, and he goes to school here. His yeah. wife's from here. Yeah. So we have 30, you know, 32 players that yeah. are from here. Yeah. Which is amazing. So that was that all added into the to the experience, and yeah. and you know the guys bought in, and yeah, that's great. There's your result tonight. And you know when you're when you can feel the vibe in the community. Everybody's happy that the Roos are back, yeah. and you can see that when you look in the stands every night. Yeah. I mean, it's so packed up in the bar. There's a couple people <laughs> having some fun up there as well. So, yeah. I mean, Brian, I want to thank you very much. It was a great game. Yeah, okay, five four finish. I think you guys should have, you know. You know, gotten a, yes. a bit better of a yeah. score there, but but it was a great game. Yeah. So thank you very much for all your hard if work I out here. One more yeah, thing. please do. You know, tonight we brought out like Albert, yeah, gas off, and yep. you know, yeah, get four excellent rooms, point. and that's their idea is is bring those guys because that's what yeah. we want. Yeah, we want. It's easier if those guys come in and talk in our dress room, say hi to the guys, because yeah. everyone looks up to them. No doubt. About Growing it. up, that's what I did. You know, yeah. I looked up to the guys yeah. that played in junior, and then and that was unbelievable tonight. Yeah. Especially with the retro jerseys. Absolutely. A great time. Absolutely. It's nice to see these banners up in this in this barn and, and to have those guys come back must be quite an inspiration in that yes. room, eh? And if I can, from the ruse, best of the holidays, Merry Christmas. That's excellent. And yourself too. Thanks a lot, Brian. All right. Thanks for that. The last December garage sale is this weekend for the Lions Club. It will be December 15th at the Maple Park Mall. And also we want to make a note that the shopping spree that we've been talking about for weeks and weeks 
was won by Lenore Yorston and Diane Pagliaro. The event is going to take place at 8 a.m. on Tuesday, December 18th at Save On, so I highly recommend getting out there to cheer these uh, individuals on. This is going to be a riot watching So this. if you're available, we'll both go in the morning, okay? There you go, done All deal. Right. All right. All so right. that's exciting news uh, mm -hmm. that we, we had some local people winning that event. Mm -hmm. So we get to see them go crazy for five It'll minutes. be fun, yeah. <laughs> we'll get the camera and we'll run along with them and we'll play crazy music, you know. It'll yeah. be fun. All awesome. Right. All right. But we won't show it until January. We'll have to do that. Because yeah. this is our last regular show uh, before the Christmas break. We are going to have a Christmas special. Okay. But uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Okay. Okay. Last week, uh, last show rather, Dave Brown spoke with our own Bert DeVink about the history of gold. That was his third of four episodes on, on, on the gold theme. Mm -hmm. Dave Brown's a great guy. What a raconteur he is. And he was talking about how eggs were 250 or something a piece in those days. You know, the, the people who made the money were the merchants. Yep. <laughs> I, I think that, that, that you'd skim a little bit off everything. Anyway, uh, anyway, it was a very entertaining little discussion. And this is the fourth show of, uh, that pro of the uh, series. And so I want to say uh, thanks very much to Dave Brown. Let's take a look at uh, the last episode of Golden Boy. Let's check it out. My name is Bertha Vink and we are again with Dave Brown uh, for the last episode of the uh, gold history of this area. Thanks again, Dave. Oh, you bet, Bert. Yeah, glad yeah. to be back. Great. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so the, it was the winter of 1861 when, uh, when Williams Creek was first prospected. It was February of 1861. There was a William Dietz on the creek. William Dietz, Williams Creek. Uh, and he, he was prospecting the area, and you've got to imagine what it was like prospecting in February. There's generally 10 feet of snow on the ground. These men had to dig down through 10 feet of snow. Oh, that's, that's usually more. Usually more. Yeah. You're right. There's, but it'll, let's say there was 10 feet of snow mm, on the ground. Okay. Imagine digging your way down through 10 feet of snow, uh, building a fire on the frozen gravels, scooping that dirt into your coal pan, uh, melting snow or whacking a hole with a pick into Williams Creek and panning out your winnings. And William Dietz, he recovered a dollar to the pan. That was the best pan of his party. And uh, it wasn't a great showing. It's in fact a starvation wage in the inflated caribou gold fields world, yeah, yeah. but it was a showing of gold. Yeah. And they've got to stake a claim somewhere, sometime, and they stake a claim on Williams Creek. Uh, other men, encouraged by their move, followed suit, and uh, there were a number of claims stuck, staked on Williams Creek in the upper part of Williams Creek near the courthouse. Now oh, yes, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, and these men, they weren't finding much gold, but they were all had the sincere hope that things would get better in the spring. And the spring came, the snow melted, the frost came out of the gravel, and the men were able to dig, and they dug their way down through eight or ten feet of worthless gravel down to a very hard layer of blue clay. Uh. Now the blue clay in Richfield is incredibly hard. I mean so hard that as hard as you hit it with your pick, your pick's going to sink about one inch. Unlike rock, it won't shatter, it just absorbs the force of your blow. And uh, many miners figured the blue clay was bedrock. Uh. And to this day, blue clay, the hard blue clay, is called false bedrock finding little or no gold on top of that blue clay. No. Many no. miners, they just abandoned Williams Creek and they called Williams Creek nothing but a humbug. Well, they were fools. Because two men came along that proved everybody wrong. Abbott and Jordan. Now, Long Abbott, he was about six foot eight, 285 pounds, solid muscle. Big bugger. Oh yeah, a real grizzly bear of a man. A, a <laughs> lot like me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, at any rate, uh, he dug beneath the blue clay while his partner was gone. Yeah, yeah. And he recovered 56 ounces of gold in 48 hours. Ooh. Now that is about four and a half pounds in two days. Holy, holy, so that is. That's something. Yeah. But you know what? Next door on the steel claim, they ripped up the blue clay, 20 to 30 pounds of gold every day for three weeks in a row. Holy, eh? Now, you know, men are getting so rich, it's stupid. Uh, imagine, you know, you find 
30 pounds of gold a day, every day for five days, how many pounds of gold does that give you? There's 150, 150 pounds. 150 pounds of gold. That's a lot of now, gold. Now, are you going to leave that gold in your cabin when you go to work? <laughs> no, no, you're going to pack it from your cabin to where you're working. And what are you going to find that day? Another stinking 30 pounds. You'll be staggering at the, under the weight of your wealth at the end of six days. That's why successful miners were paying unsuccessful miners and native packers enormous sums of money to pack their gold out of Williams Creek late fall of 1861. Now, all this activity is taking place in Richfield. It's only eight or ten feet to bedrock up there. How far did Billy Barker have to dig down here in Williams Creek? I think it was about 50, 60 feet. Yeah, they say 52 feet. Yeah. Now, the problem is, have you ever dug a hole in the beach? Yeah. You, you've lived in Holland. <laughs> and, and what happens when you dig a hole in Holland? It fills up. It fills with water. Yeah. And you've got yeah. the same problem here in Barkerville. You yeah. dig down 10 feet, you hit the water table. Yeah. Billy Barker had to go through 42 feet of water to get to his gold. Now, how do you get 42 feet of water out of your mine shaft? With a windlass. It's just like a well. Yeah. Two men on a hand crank, two five-gallon buckets. One bucket goes up full as another bucket goes down empty. A simple skip system. Yeah. Two shifts of men, 12 hours each, 24 hours a day, non-stop, back-breaking labor. But Billy Barker, he clawed his way down 50-odd feet, and he started sending up $5 to the pan. That's a third of an ounce of gold, roughly mm, six, seven hundred bucks, our money today, mm -hmm. to a shovel full of dirt. Does that sound good? Well, what's phenomenal about Barker's strike is he hit five dollars a pan at 52 feet, but he didn't hit bedrock until 80 feet. All right. This translates to 30 feet of paying gravel. And when he bottomed his shaft, when he hit the bedrock, one crevice in that bedrock, one cubic foot of gravel, yielded 50 ounces of gold. <laughs> you know, that in our money today translates to 50, about, about $100,000 to a cubic foot of dirt. <laughs> News of that hits the rest of the world, where's everybody coming? Yeah. They're coming to Barkerville, and they're bringing mining technology, investment capital from around the world. Yeah. And if, if there's a reason Barkerville's lasted all these years, whereas the other gold camps have fallen under snow and decay yeah. and ruin, it's because Barkerville was built on 30 feet of paying gravel. It took six or eight weeks to just to hit bedrock. It'd take many years to mine that immense gold deposit out. And that, that richness is reflected in Barkerville's architecture. They built it to last, yeah, and yeah. last it has for now more than 150 years. Yeah. Well, that's the end of things, Bert. Uh, it was a real pleasure having you. Yeah, thanks yeah. a lot, yeah, Dave. Yeah, within, having a chat. Uh, as you know, I worked in Barkerville myself in the yeah. display department. Uh, I know part of the history, but not as refined as you've been uh, bringing it to us. Yeah. Thanks a lot for doing that. You, you it was bet. really great. Thanks, Bert. Thanks. Yep. Now it's time to see what's happening in Quinell with our community calendar. Dave Sutton. Dave Sutton. Yes, we have Sutton shutters. Last time, last week, we had these beautiful uh, little statues that he did that are at the uh, Church of Latter Day Saints. Mm -hmm. uh, but Dave was also at the Christmas parade, and here's uh -huh. some, here are some pictures uh, that Dave took of the Christmas parade. They're beautiful ones, beautiful kids, beautiful uh, sleighs, and uh, yeah. wonderful things. So let's take a quick look.
Those are great. And I was actually in that parade this time. Yeah, I did see you in the picture. What? So. Oh, we were, maybe maybe you were. We in missed there. the party float. Uh, it was the, the K-Max party float. Mm -hmm. We had all the guys and girls on there, and uh, it might have been there. Might have been there. We'll yeah. take a quicker look, but a better it, look. I got to tell you, just just from being in the parade, what a great event! And there yeah. were so many people. It's it's a really uh, an event where people get out and want to see Quinell and downtown, and real yeah. festive atmosphere. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed being part of it. Good, so. good. Well, I believe. Oh, we got another message there. Yeah, coming up next week, uh, we're going to show. Uh, show part uh, part of the Christmas concert that Susan McNeil organized right. uh, uh, with proceeds going to the Seniors Advocacy Service and then after that uh, we'll be back on January January the 8th okay okay well that's it for this show uh, we want to thank you for tuning in we want to hear from you with your story and your comments on our show we want to know how we're doing and what stories we think uh, you think we should be uh, talking about so definitely give us your feedback you can email your ideas to qtoday at qcatv.ca with that story or your idea, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, remember, Q Today is about... Quinnell talking to Quinnell. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.